welcome, good evening. Oh, come on, guys, let me hear it. Here we go, welcome, good evening to Fort Worth, Texas, the revival capital of the world. It's Wednesday night. Wednesday night is where we take the word and learn to stand victoriously in life. You agree with that? We're so grateful. I'm grateful that all of you are here, and I'm very grateful that you are there, watching from the top of the world to the bottom, all the way around the middle. My name is Greg Stevens. I'm an associate pastor here at Eagle Mountain Church, and uh, we have a wonderful message service for you. Bishop Jester, most right reverend. That's what he told me to say. So uh, he's with us tonight, so get your Bibles ready, get a notepad ready, and uh, it's going to be good. Let me give you a few announcements um, that I want to share with you. Coming up this Sunday, February the 10th at 11 Eastern, 10 a.m. Central Time, who's going to be here? Anybody know? Rick Renner will be here from Moscow, Russia, and uh, he's in the main service uh, this Sunday. You don't want to miss that. And then all of the women in the room for Thrive on Tuesday, Denise Renner will be speaking um, this. Okay, all right, if we're going to do it, if we're going to do it, Pastor Brenda, am I right? If we're going to, women, if you're going to cheer for Denise Renner, let's do it. Ready? One, two, three. There we go. There we go. That's better. I gotta wake. Are you are you guys sleepy across the uh, fruited plain, or is it just in here? We're okay. We're good at me. Um, so Denise will be here on uh, Tuesday evening, February twelfth. Rick will be here Sunday morning. Um, a local church announcement that I need to give to you. Uh, this is for married couples only, and it's date night. All the married couples are like, "What? What? Date night?" I got past that a long time ago. No, then you need to be at date night. If you, if all the guys in the room thought, what? You need to be at date night. February the 15th from 7 to 9 p.m. You can find out more information uh, if you go to emic.org, emic.org, and you can get uh, more information on that. Okay, Wednesday night, February the 27th, we will not be having live church in here. So if you come here Wednesday night, February 27th, you're going to be by yourself because we won't be here. What we are is we're getting ready for Brother Copeland with KC and you on the mountain beginning the next night. So we're taking that night to get ready, and uh, you will not lose out on the network. We're going to have a wonderful program um, just for you that watching all in the Believer's Voice of Victory Network. And so that will be February the 27th. What day is that? Wednesday night, February 27th, there's no um, live church um, here in the, in the, uh, at Eagle Mountain. That is because of the 20th. Matter of fact, instead of me talking about Kenneth Copeland and you, let's play a little promo of it. Roll that, guys, and we'll come right back. You have to be here. You just have to be here and experience it for yourself firsthand. If you want to be part of something bigger than yourself, you've got to be in the room. It's not just the word that blesses you, but it's the glory that falls after the messages. When you get in a meeting like this, the plan of God for your life becomes clear and your life will never be the same. Where I come from, you don't get this anywhere for free. The presence of God is here and you need to be here too. Amen. So you want to be here February 28th through March the 2nd. Every evening, Brother Copeland will be speaking. We were talking about this today in a, in a meeting with some pastors in the, in the uh, ministry here. And the way to live victoriously, the way to be a word of faith person is to have total immersion. You can't just try this thing. You have to be totally immersed into this doctrine from the word of God, right? And so one of the best ways for you to get total immersion is to be here on those dates, uh, March 28th through, I mean, February 28th through March the 2nd for Kenneth Copeland and you on the mountain. So make your plans now. There will be some services, some teachings in the morning, and then Brother Copeland um, in the evening. March the 17th, Jesse Duplantis will be at church. Jesse Duplantis. March the 17th. Let me go a little further out so you can mark it on your calendars. March the 29th and 30th, Miracles on the Mountain return. 
So we want you to be part of that. So all of those, all of those announcements, you can find them, emic.org or kcm.org slash events is how you can get all of those announcements. Okay, you ready? It is offering time. So please welcome Kent Satterfield. He is our new communication, uh, community pastor, the community pastor. Welcome him, would you? Kent, thank you. Praise the Lord. This is a time that we get to give. We get to sow right now. And I was thinking about that. And being from East Tennessee, we have a lot of what we call red clay mud. And I was thinking about the red clay mud, and there isn't much that grows in that mud. But then my thoughts carried on to where I was thinking about Granny's garden. And the reason Granny's garden was so fertile is because she worked the soil. She worked it and it cultivated it and, and would plant her seed and expected harvest. You know, and because of that, I think about us and about planting you know, seed into fertile ground. And why is the ground fertile at EMIC? Number one, because Brother Copeland, he preached the word for years and years and years. And he plowed the ground and plowed the ground with the word. And then because the atmosphere of faith that cultivates the soil... We can expect a harvest. Every time you sow a seed, we can expect that harvest. It's twofold. This is good ground, but not only that, you're good ground. We're all part of this together, in this journey together. So if you'd like to read in Psalms 119, I'd like to start in verse 9. I'm reading out of the Passion Translation because it really, I thought it was pretty neat. How can a young man stay pure? Only by living in the word of God and walking in its truth. I have longed for you with passion of my heart, so don't let me stray from your directions. I consider your prophecies to be my greatest treasure. I memorize them and write them on my heart to keep them from committing sins that treason against you. My wonderful God, you are to be praised above all. I speak continually of your laws as I recite out loud your counsel to me. And I find more joy in following what you tell me to do than in chasing after all the wealth of the world. And I set my hearts on your precepts and pay close attention to all your ways. And my delight is found in all your laws, and I won't forget to walk in your words. Now, why is that important for today? Because when we sow seed... We expect a harvest. When my granny put seed in the ground that she worked, she knew that harvest was coming. But I'll share something else. There was so much harvest that came from my granny's garden that she was able to share that harvest with all of her neighbors. She had so much harvest that she couldn't contain it within our house, within her house, but the neighbors, the mailman would come and she would give them the harvest. Well, guess what? That's called the abundant harvest. And this is the year of abundant harvest. This is what's happening on the mountain right now. Praise the Lord. See, EMIC's abundance is upon you. And our motivation for accumulation is distribution. That's right. Praise the Lord. Let me share Psalms 20, verses 5 through 3. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you, Lord. In Psalms 20, it says, When you succeed, we all celebrate and shout for joy. Flags will fly when victory is yours. Yes, God will answer your prayers and we will praise Him. I know that God's, God gives me all that I ask for and brings victory to his anointed king. And my deliverance cry will be heard in his holy heaven. And by his mighty hand, miracles will be manifest through him, through his saving strength. God never forgets a single seed that we sow. He remembers everyone. He sees it. But how do we get the seed to grow? We have to cultivate it with the word. So my family, what we do is we make declarations every year. Now, you all that was here a few weeks ago when Brother Jerry was here, he named off a bunch of verses, and then he made declarations. Well, 
every single day, my wife and my, and my daughters and my children and every evening and all the time, I'm watering it because I'm expecting. I'm expecting. You should be expecting because God is going to do what His Word says. It's not because He owes us anything. But it's the matter that He said He's going to do it. His Word said He's going to do it. He finds pleasure in blessing His children. And that's who we are, His children. So if you'd allow me, I want to make a declaration. But I'm going to declare these these scriptures and the declarations over you and your house. In Genesis 8, 22, it says, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Therefore, I sow my seed. I sow it in faith, knowing that the law of seed time harvest is working for me. Seed, you're supposed to harvest, and I'm expecting a harvest. In Genesis 1, 11, God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and, and fruit tree yielding fruit after its own kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Therefore, we have sown our financial seeds. And we're expecting them to produce after their kind in the form of financial blessings and financial harvest. In Mark 4, 26 and 27, he said, so is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and seed should spring and grow up, and he knows not how. Therefore, I'm expecting every seed that each of us have sown to grow and to spring up and produce an abundant harvest. Job 36, 11 says, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Therefore, because we have been obedient... We've been obedient to God and we've sown our seeds and we fully expect our days to be filled with prosperity and many years of pleasures. In Psalms 115, 12, it says, The Lord has been mindful to us. He'll bless us. He'll bless the house of Israel. He'll bless the house of Aaron. The Lord shall increase us more and more, you and your children. Therefore, because God has seen us sowing and His mind is on us continually. He is thinking about you all the time. We expect more and more financial blessings, more and more financial increase to come into our lives. And Luke 6.38 says, Given it shall be given with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you met with all, it shall be measured to you again. Therefore, I expect good measure. I expect it to be pressed down and shaken together, running over that abundance that we're talking about. An abundance to where we can be, we live to give. Amen. Where we can supply those around us. Mm. I'm expecting, in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, says, But this I say, he that sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he that sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Therefore, we expect a bountiful harvest because we are bountiful sowers. I love to give. I love to sow seed. I'm throwing it everywhere I can. I adore the fact that the Lord has given me seed to sow. In verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Therefore, I expect to have all sufficiency, more than enough, abounding in financial blessings, so that I'm able to sow in every good work the Holy Spirit impresses upon me. Believe in the Lord your God, so you shall be established. Believe His prophets, so you shall prosper. Therefore, since I do believe in the Lord my God, I believe what His prophet has spoken regarding 2019 being the year of our abundant harvest, and that we're expecting this each and every day throughout this year to come to pass in our lives. In the name of Jesus, so be it. And many times, Pastor George has made this statement. The depths of our praise will determine the magnitude of our harvest. So praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Father God. Get your seed ready if you all want to serve them. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Father God. Anybody need one? Lord, I speak abundance right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, this is a year of abundant harvest, and we look forward to seeing what you're going to do. Father God, show us your glory. Show us your magnificence. Lord, we just we wait with anticipation to see what our seed will bring forth, Father God. Lord, when we sow into good ground, 
We know that we're sowing from the top of the world to the bottom and all around the middle, Father God. Lord, and we honor you and we praise you with our seed. And Lord, we look forward to what tomorrow holds as a harvest comes. We love you and we praise you and we honor you. Amen. Amen. So, Paul would say often in Scripture, I thank God always for you. I thank my Lord for you. And so I just want to thank you for sowing into this ministry. I want to thank you watching us to sow in this ministry. Those of you watching us online, on, on television, on the network, here's how you can be part of sowing tonight into this. EMIC.org slash give. EMIC.org slash give. And uh, all, of that, all of that is secure. If you want to text to give with your mobile device, you can text the number 36609. The keyword is the EMIC plus the dollar amount. Text 36609 EMIC and the amount that you want to give. And that's how you can be part of this. And I just want to say thank you. Okay, you ready for the word? Yeah. Would you welcome with me, please, Pastor John Jester to this platform? Amen. Hit it, buddy. I'm excited. People always ask me, they go, so how'd it go when you were preaching? I always tell them, listen, it went well for me. You had to ask somebody who was listening to give you an objective opinion. My opinion is very subjective. Will you stand with me? Let's go before the Lord and pray. Father, in Jesus name, we thank you for this opportunity to come before your word. Lord, we never take it lightly. We expect to hear something fresh and new and exciting that will change our lives and rearrange us and move us more and more into your image from glory to glory. So Lord, we expect to go from one level of glory tonight to the next. Father, I pray that you would speak through my lips, think through my mind. Father, that I pray that this word would go forth unhindered and unchecked by any demonic force or uh, dark activity, but Father, that it would pierce to the hearts of those who are listening and that they would be changed from glory to glory. Father, I thank you for this download. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I pray over their week. Just prompted right now to pray over the rest of your week. Father, I thank you for the abundance of harvest that's coming to them this week. God, I thank you for testimonies that are still yet to happen this week. Lord, I believe that things have already been set in motion this week for the supernatural to happen in their lives. That Father, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we would recognize a move of God in every situation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Glory to God, glory to God. You may be seated. I'm excited about tonight. I know it's the middle of the week, but I'm gonna need y'all to get more excited with me. Otherwise, I'm gonna look a little crazy up here because I'm gonna, I'm gonna be excited and have a party whether you party with me or not. Um, do we, uh, are any of our Bible college students in the room? Anybody in here? All right. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I want to apologize to you in advance because what I'm about to say, I said to you in the KCBC chapel, um, and I want to make sure that you understand that I tried everything possible. I did get a fresh word for you. All right. I didn't just go back into my old notes and pull out something. Ah, this sounds good. So I'm gonna preach that. Right. I did get a fresh word for you and I tried everything possible not to do this tonight. I actually went into Pastor Greg's office, sat down and was like, yeah, I'm gonna talk about, you know, this uh, re responding to the word of God and how to condition your reflexes. And it was great, man. I mean, it was coming out with scripture and everything. He was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I went back to my office, sat down. And the Lord said, OK, now I want you to go talk about what I want you to talk about. And so I went back to his office. I said, yeah, I changed my mind. I think I'm going to do this vision thing that I did uh, this past week. And it just seemed right. The Lord has really been talking to me a lot about the importance of vision in this season for, for specifically for us in the household of faith, um, just specifically because of where Brother Copeland is. Just looking at Brother Copeland and understanding that he is not slowing down. Like he is not, there's no shortage of vision. There's no shortage of prophetic utterance. There's no shortage of momentum coming from him. And if he's fired up, then we ought to be fired up. And I'll put that into personal. I need to be fired up. And you can't be fired up unless you know what you're fired up about. 
which means when we hear something like the year of abundant harvest, it ought to provoke in us a vision for what the year of abundant harvest actually means. And so uh, I was listening to David Ellis and he was talking about Brother Copeland and Pastor George and Pastor Terry. He says, I've been with him for 25 years. And he actually said these words. I wrote them down specifically. He says, I have been with Brother Copeland for 25 years where Brother Copeland, Pastor George and Pastor Terry are now. I've never seen him or them more fervent, focused and on fire than right now. That's a big statement. That's a big statement. You've never seen him more on fire than he is right now. And you, you think about it, though, Sister Gloria talking about the prophetic visions that the Lord has given her for this property and, and cars lined up down Boat Club Road, getting, tr- coming to the revival capital of the world. And if you if you um, really, truly investigate it, you understand that we are sitting on the cusp of something right now. Something happening, something happening. And I don't say that to provoke any, any, any iota of fear in you. You understand that for the household of faith, everything's going to be what? All right. all right. Everything's going to be just fine for us. Everything's going to be all right for the household of faith. But we're in a, 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 a an extremely prophetic time um, where the, where there are things shifting and changing in the spirit realm. And it's like, I know we're not feeling led, like we're not led by our feelings, but you can sense it so much that you can feel it. Right? Like I can sense it so much that I can just, it's, it's tangible. It's a tangible sensing of what God is doing in the earth right now. Also, if you look at 2019, um, how many of you feel like 2019 is flying and it's absolutely moving at the speed of my goodness? We are, we've, we've done so much and seen so much already, and we've only been in 2019 for one month. All right. And other than the fact that I still haven't taken the Christmas lights down on the outside of my house, the inside is taken care of, but on the outside of my house, that's the only thing that I got to remind me that Christmas li- literally just passed. Don't judge me. I see you looking at me in that tone of voice. I see you. I see you. I hope my HOA is not watching. Anyway, love y'all. If you are watching, Praise God. Anyway, so these are the people that take pictures of your house and put them on your door and say, you need to take care of this. Thank God for the HOA. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Tells us something critical. And I want to use this as the backdrop for what I'm for what we're learning tonight. Tells us something critical about vision and the process of vision. It says this in the King James Version of the Bible, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, the New King James Version of the Bible says, where there is no revelation. King James says, where there's no vision. New King James says, where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint. If you're if you're if you're in your Bible right now, you know, around here, we like to write in our Bibles, underline the word restraint. That's going to become important as we as we work through this. It says where there is no revelation, also underline the word revelation, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Now, we understand that. In the Bible, when the word law is used, you can substitute the word law with the word, right? So happy is he who keeps the word, all right? The Passion Translation says it this way, where there is no clear prophetic vision, where there is no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of the word, it actually uses the word, the word. When you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss fills your soul. Heaven's bliss fills your soul. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that word happy right there is translated blessed. It's translated blessed. So you could say where where there is no vision, the people perish, but Blessed is he who keeps the law or keeps the word. The word vision literally means prophetic communication from God. 
a divine communication from God. So tonight, if we're going to talk about vision, which what we need to understand first and foremost is we're not talking about your vision for the thing that you just want because you want it and you have a desire in your heart for that. I'm not telling you that that's wrong or that that's out of place. I believe the the Bible is true when he says he gives us all things richly to enjoy. I believe that if God has given you the desires of your heart, you've had a heart change, then you're not going to want something that is uh, that is illegal or immoral. You need to understand you can't use your faith to rob a bank. You do understand that, right? I'm talking to, I'm just going to go ahead and stipulate that we ain't got any bank robbers in this room nor watching us at home. And if you're watching us and you are, a, have been a bank robber at some point or another, you can't do that by faith. All right. The word of God does not support you robbing a bank, right? You cannot believe God for something that is not supported by the word. There's nothing wrong with you believing God for something that you just want because you want to be able to enjoy it. Right. There's nothing wrong with you believing God. If you got yacht faith, then baby rock out. Believe God for a yacht. If the Lord has dropped it in your heart to believe for a jet, then rock out. Believe God for a jet. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm talking about a different level of vision. All right. I'm not just talking about things that we desire that we want. I'm talking about what God has placed in your heart for you, for your life in this moment. Vision for your assignment, vision for your anointing, vision for your calling, vision for your destiny, vision for your children. What has God told you about what he intends to do with you right now? It got real quiet. Think about it. Think about it, because the Bible says where there is no prophetic revelation, where there is no revelation, where there is no continual revelation. I like the Amplified Bible. It actually says where there is no redemptive revelation. People cast off restraint. So we're talking about vision that came from God. Well, if it's a word from God, then you can use the faith of God for the word of God that's been spoken over your life. Right. So vision in our lives should operate through the word, by the word, like the word. If it came from God, then he's going to do what he said he's going to do. Amen. 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 So I want to look at some some key ingredients to vision. Some key ingredients to vision. Y'all didn't know vision had ingredients, did you? Because sometimes we don't think about vision as having parts and operations. We just think when we hear somebody say you got to have vision or go do your vision board, it's like, all right, I'm going to go print off everything that I want and use up all the ink in my printer and stick that up on the board and call that my vision board because I like this Cadillac. So I'm going to print a full color 11 by 17 picture of this Cadillac and stick it on my refrigerator and call that my vision board. (laughs) Nothing wrong with the picture of the Cadillac on your, do not go home and snatch the picture of the Cadillac off your refrigerator and go, Pastor John said I can't have a Cadillac. That's not what I said. All right. But I do want to want you to understand that vision is a process of walking something out. And it's bigger that if you put that picture on your refrigerator and all you ever do is just open and close your refrigerator and you never go back and actually use your faith for what's on your refrigerator, then all you've done is wasted ink and paper. You you have to walk out the vision of God in your life. You have to work it. Hold that before the Lord. Pastor Terry says something and it just changed the way I live my life. She said this. She said, you don't have to work for salvation, but you do have to work your salvation. You don't have to work for faith, for faith. You have the faith of God, but you do have to work your faith. So we need to understand that when God has downloaded something into our hearts that is vision for who we are, that's something that has a process and it has to be cultivated. Like Pastor Kent was talking talking about earlier, you are good ground, but good ground has to be cultivated, aerated. You got to pull the weeds out. You got to get rid of the stinking thinking and give that give that thing that God the word, which the Bible says that the sower sows the word. So the word's supposed to bear fruit, but you've got to cultivate it so that it can bear fruit. So there's some key ingredients, some key parts to vision. The first one, the most important one is this. 
Vision for the believer requires faith. Vision for the believer requires faith. If you don't know how to do it by faith, it ain't vision. I thank you all four of y'all who got on board with that statement. But it's true, right? Our, our goal is to help you stand victoriously in life. Well, a part of helping you stand victoriously in life is helping you understand that whatever you do in the kingdom has to be done by grace through faith. It has to include the grace that God has afforded you to be able to do what it is that you're doing and stand in the place where you're standing and have the anointing that you have, but also the faith that takes it. And the faith and that faith is active taking. Brother Copeland teaches that faith is a force and you have to use the force. I'm not talking about Star Wars. I'm just saying you have to actually do something with your faith. Vision for the believer requires faith. Faith begins where the will of God is known. So you can't have vision outside of knowing what the will of God is for what it is that you're believing for. That's right. Amen. Thank you. I'm, I love the three people who are sitting in like this general <laughs> section, right? I'm just going to stand right here and preach right here all night long because they are on board with me. Everybody else is try, still trying to clock out from work. I'm just saying. <laughs> Faith begins where the will of God is known. So you need to ask the Lord if vision, if the Hebrew definition of vision is a prophetic download, a, a, a divine communication, then that communication has to come from the Lord. So if the Lord says something like the year of abundant harvest, then it probably stands to reason that we need to take that to the Lord and say, Lord, what's my part in the year of abundant harvest? And what does abundant harvest look like in my household? What's my part in the year of abundant harvest? How am I supposed to, what, what part do I play? That's a big statement. The year of abundant harvest is a big statement and there's abundant harvest in a lot of different avenues. But the question is, what's my part? How do I function in that? And sometimes I believe that we can hear these words and they're so big and they encompass so much of what God wants to do in our lives that we never take a moment and say, God, what's step one? What is step one? And we see other people's step one and their step one looks like our step 17. And all of a sudden we want to be on step 17. So we act like we're on step 17. And we pretend to be on step 17. We dress like we on step 17. I'm on, what y'all talking about? I got on step 17 shoes and this jacket is step 17. And I'm ready as I'm on step 17. When you haven't, actually sought the Lord about what is step one. What, where, where do I begin in this? How do I start this thing off? Vision that pleases God has to start, progress, and is accomplished by faith. It requires that we understand and be honest with where we are in faith right now. One of the best uh, parts of understanding faith is you got to understand that everyone is dealt the measure of faith. So God is not going to give you any more faith, but the faith that you have can be developed, strengthened, grown and used. We have to be honest with ourselves about where we are as individuals in faith. In maybe, maybe just maybe you don't have Cadillac faith just yet. I know this is hard for some people to hear because some people are like we all got Cadillac faith. Pastor John, don't tell me what I can't believe for. You are absolutely right. I'm not going to tell you what you can't believe for. But, but line upon line, precept upon precept. Let's be real about the thing. All right. How about we believe to pay our light bill? All right. And then once we believe to pay our light bill and we got that bad boy under control, then we can start believing to pay other people's light bill. See, that's the key to be to abundant harvest. Abundant harvest comes and it's sustainable. It's not momentary. Amen. 
All right. So so if what we're believing for is to get out of a system of living but from miracle to miracle and living in a constant state of miracles, then we got to be honest about where we are in the development of our faith and what we need to do to get to another level of faith. I love Keith Moore's uh, meeting called greater faith. That must mean that the faith that I have right now can be what? Greater. 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 I never stop growing and developing and cultivating my faith. Why? Because faith is hungry. Faith is hungry. It is constantly looking for the next thing to grab hold of, the next thing to progress into. What's the next thing God's saying? And God's never going to say something to you that outstrips your ability to believe him. He's never going to tell you something that you can't that you don't have the capacity to believe him for. And sometimes I believe that that is the key to us understanding what God wants us to do and who he wants us to be, i.e. our calling. There are many Christians who are looking for their calling in life. What does God want? What, if I'm, what am I called to do? 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 Well, the greater, the more you develop your faith, the bigger your capacity is to receive the large things of God. Your calling is not hidden from you. It's hidden for you. It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. So God's not trying to conceal anything from you. It's he, he has something on hold, on reserve for you in the kingdom. But here's the thing. He's not going to show you something that is going to outstrip your faith. Maybe just maybe if God showed you what you were supposed to do in the kingdom, it would freak you out where you are right now. So maybe the way that I get to the place where it won't freak me out is I develop my faith to a point that I have the capacity. And this is what our senior pastor teaches us. Pastor George always talks about enlarging your capacity to receive the things of God. Well, maybe God's called you to something big. And I would even venture to tell you that sometimes those people who are called to go through something big or those who are called to do something big have gone through some big stuff. All right. If you find yourself in a season of going through something big, then maybe you're called to do something big. And the devil knows that you're called to do something big. So he had to send something big to stop you. So if we develop our faith to a point where we can receive the bigness of the calling that God's placed on our life. Then we can develop vision for that thing. That's why it's so important that you are honest with yourself about where you are in your faith walk. Listen, there's therefore now no condemnation. No one's going to look at you and be like, oh, you ain't in faith then. You know, you can't believe for this. What do you, what do you, what, huh? Sometimes we can be a little bit of the faith police. Let people be honest and real about where they are in their development, in their process. And then we can come alongside people and help them in their development, in their process. Now, listen, I didn't learn this by working with adults. I actually learned this by working with teenagers. <laughs> teenagers will tell you right where they are. They will tell you right where they are. You know, you can believe to make A's. Uh, uh I've been flunking that class forever. I can't believe to make an A in that class. Well, let's, well, well yes, you can. No, uh, uh, that ain't for me. Well, then. Uh, all right. Listen. How about a C? You got you got C faith. You got, yeah. OK. All right. I can I can believe with C. See, I can work with C faith. I can work with C faith because we can move C faith to a B faith and we can move B faith to an A faith and we can move A faith to valedictorian faith. See what I'm saying? All right. I'm gonna leave you all alone. All right. Number two. Vision must be written and spoken. Vision must be written and spoken. This is why I didn't tell you to take the Cadillac off of your refrigerator. Because vision must be written and spoken. Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 says this. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets 
that he may run who reads it. Now, the Amplified Classic Bible says when it says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and I will watch to see what he will say. It says, I will watch to see what he will say as his mouthpiece. Which means that he's saying something to you so that you have something to say. Vision must be, and he says, write the vision and make it plain. But in there, it implies that as his mouthpiece, you're going to say what you're writing. Now, I had a very scholarly question about this. He says, what about vision that is given to you that is personal? Maybe you don't want to write that down for everyone to see. Well, write it down so that you can see it. Write it down so that you can see it. You need to see you write that down. You need to hear you say that. You need to hear you declare what it is that God is saying concerning your life. Now, he uses a very interesting word here. He says, write it, write the vision and make it what? Plain. Plain. Oh, y'all are awake. Maybe, maybe it's just maybe it's a little quiet because you're actually writing. I'm OK with that. I'm all right with that. But I, like I said, I work with young people. So whenever it's quiet, either something needs to uh, somebody needs to go check on somebody or or you're asleep. Y'all can see the whites of your eyes and y'all are all grown. So I'm not going to send anybody to go check on you. Do a hand check. I'm that's OK. We're going to be all right. All right. So it says write the vision and make it what? Plain. plain. That word plain actually means to declare. Write the vision and make it so that it can be declared and you make it plain by declaring it. Have you ever noticed that when you talk something out, it actually gets more plain to you? Have you ever noticed that you learn more when you teach somebody else? Why? Because there's a process of teaching by which you confirm what is already in you. So when you impart that knowledge, you're saying and yourself is hearing what you're saying. And it just double confirms what it is that you already know. Vision must be both written and declared or spoken. The way that you make vision plain so that it gains momentum is you write it and you say it. Now, listen, this one of the saddest things. One of the saddest things is someone who has vision, but that vision has no momentum. Why is that sad? Well, it's because at some point there you received a download from the Lord. At some point, God told you something that had packaged in his. He says he upholds all things by the word of his power. So packaged in what God tells you is the full force of heaven. And all the power that's necessary to carry that out. Yep. Come on. That's good. But whether or not it gains momentum and traction is totally up to you. That's good. Totally up to you. There's nothing that happens in the kingdom of God by accident. Nothing that happens in the kingdom of God by you just stumbling over. You didn't get saved that way. You didn't get saved that way. I don't I don't, I don't know. If, I'm, I'm not going to make any any um, uh, any grandiose statements, but I would venture to say that none of you got saved by running up here, tripping, falling on the altar and you turned over and went, I'm saved. <laughs> that didn't happen, right? right? You did something. You did something. You were saved by grace through faith. You heard the word preached, faith built in your heart. The grace that God provided met the faith action that you took. It's where you accepted salvation. You accepted Jesus as the Lord of your life. And there was an action and a reaction. You did something. You drew close to him. He drew close to you. And now he lives inside your heart. It was not accidental. Well, guess what? Everything else in the kingdom of God works that way. You're healed. By grace through faith. You're delivered by grace through faith. You're prosperous by grace through faith. You're set free by grace through faith. And you ought to apply the grace through faith principle to everything else you do. Stay married by grace through faith. Parent your children by grace through faith. Amen. Keep your job by grace through faith. Some of y'all like, where is the abundance of grace? I need that because this job is tripping. No, I'm just saying you have to use by grace through faith in everything that you do 
for the Lord. If you didn't get saved by accident, you don't get healed by accident, then your vision is not going to come to pass by accident. You can't just wait. You can't just sit still. It requires you do something. We're going to get into that. I'm actually jumping. Oh, look at this. It's the next point. Number three, action is a must. Action is a must. Have you anyone ever heard the phrase talk is cheap? You've heard that phrase before? Um, I put this in my notes. Talk is cheap only when there is no corresponding action. You need to understand something in the kingdom of God. Talk is never cheap. God created the world and the universe through what he said. What you say, words are never, ever cheap. We only cheapen our words when we don't act on our words, when we don't act on the word. So if you're saying your vision, but you're not following that with corresponding action, then that's what cheapens speech. Listen to this, not just my opinion. James chapter two, verse 18 says this, but and this is in the Passion Translation, but some might object or someone might object and say one person has faith and another has works. Go ahead then and prove to me that you have faith without works and I will show you faith by my works and prove to you that I believe. Do you really believe what God has said concerning who you are? Then act like it. Then act like it. But this shouldn't come as a surprise. This is what we tell our children. You need to act right. (laughs) Anybody, any parent in here ever told your children, change that attitude, boy, start acting right. We teach our children how to act. We do. We teach our children how to act. No, I'm, I'm serious. I have this conversation with my kids on a regular basis. Now, listen, the stuff they sell in this store is really expensive. So when we go in this store, you put your hands in your pockets. And most of the time it goes like this. Naomi, stop jumping around. Why? Because we want them to learn how to act. It's less it's less to about me having to pay for something. Listen, if that's my kid, then I'm on her side. Okay, I'm with her. Right, wrong or indifferent. But it's more about I want her to learn how to act in certain environments. Why? Because she could own a store like this one day. She's probably going to shop in a store like this for the rest of her life. So I need to learn. I need to teach her how to act in these situations. Right. We teach our children how to act. Sometimes we need to allow our vision to teach us how to act. If I have time, and I think I'm, I think I will, I'll share with you the second part of this, and that is the function of vision. And one of the functions of vision is vision will help you learn how to act. Vision will show you how to act. Number four. Well, hang on before I go to number four. Vision, or well, that's vision based on the word cannot be inactive, nor can it be neutral because the word is never inactive nor is it neutral. The word is alive and active and your vision should be too. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 in the NIV says this, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing of the soul and the spirit, the joint and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the word of God is able to actually condition your thoughts and your attitude. But it's always active. So vision should never be inactive. It should provoke you to action. And some people may say, well, aren't you supposed to wait on the Lord? That is absolutely true. But in the word of God, whenever it tells you to wait on the Lord, it is an active waiting. It is an active waiting. How do I know that? Well, because if he hadn't told you to do anything new, you need to be doing the thing that he told you to do the last time until he tells you to do something new. I, I'm, I've told this story before in, 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 in church service. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, in the inner city, and we rode the public transportation everywhere we went. We rode the bus everywhere we went, right? And when you go to a bus stop in Atlanta, Georgia, there's a bench, um, but you don't want to sit on that. 
You just don't want to sit on the bench. But nobody ever sits on the bench. Nobody waits on the bus in Atlanta like this. That's not how you wait on the bus in Atlanta. The way you wait on the bus in Atlanta is this. You get to the bus stop and you do this thing. Y'all seen the bus? Y'all seen the bus? What, what's your watch say? What, are you, what am I doing? I'm expecting it to come. I'm on edge expecting it to come. Even though I'm in the place where I'm supposed to be waiting on what is promised, I'm in a constant position and posture of expecting it to come. I can't sit down and be inactive. I'm up and constantly active waiting on the move of God. And sometimes we take our vision and we sit down thinking our vision is just going to swing through the window like Batman. And that's just not the case. That's just not the case. If God told you to wait, then the wait should be so dripped and drenched and soaked in expectation that it's easy for you to wait because it doesn't even feel like waiting. It doesn't even I don't even feel like I'm doing nothing. I don't feel like I'm waiting. I'm, I know that he's that which he's spoken. He's faithful to perform. So in my waiting, I'm just getting ready for him to do what it is. He said he's going to I'm going to read scripture. I'm going to quote. I'm going to remind myself and talk to myself. I'm going to speak to myself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and just season myself and get ready for the move of God. What am I doing? I'm preparing myself to step into the vision that God has downloaded into me. See, some of y'all need to start preparing yourself to be what God told you you're going to be. Don't let time lull you to sleep. Don't let time make you inactive just because he hasn't done it just yet. Maybe you still got some faith development to do. So you're waiting while you're waiting. You're developing your faith. You're cultivating and growing your capacity. Yes, Lord, I believe that. I believe that I receive that. I believe that I'm going to be that I receive. Listen, some of you do have very large vision. And I don't want you in any sense to think that by, what, by me saying that you need to be honest with where you are in your faith means that you can't believe for the big things of God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if God has downloaded something big to you, then be honest with where you are right now so that you move from that place to the next place to the next place. And that is a part of waiting on God. So while I'm waiting, I'm developing my faith. I'm cultivating. I'm listening to I'm listening to CDs. I'm listening to, to, to preachers. I'm listening to Brother Copeland. I'm digesting every I went back today and listened to Brother Copeland in two, New Year's Eve or New Year's Eve 2008. New Year's Eve 2008. Apparently 2007 was the year of the open door. So we're coming out of 2008, uh, coming out of 2007 and going into 2008, I'm listening to what he was saying in 2008. You, some of you might be like, well, it's 2019, Pastor John. It, I mean, that's 11 years. That was almost 11 years ago. I know. I know. Isn't that beautiful? Something that 11 years old could still cultivate my faith to believe for what God's doing right now. Right now. You know what got me? He said, I have received revelation on a level that I've never received revelation before. At the top of that sermon, I was like, well, I'm in. I'm in because whatever is on him, I don't believe that God took it off of him. I only believe it's been multiplied. So I want to hear what he has to say. That's expectation. And that expectation should season the way that you wait on God. You're constantly expecting God to do what he says he's going to do. Don't mistake patience. For inactivity. Don't mistake patience for inactivity. Being patient doesn't mean that you do nothing. We just covered that. Number four, the word of God. Number four, vision 
requires revelation. Vision requires revelation. I know people, and this seems almost, almost too simple, right, to even make this a point, but hear me out. I know people who have vision, and that vision doesn't include any revelation. They have vision for what they want to do, what they want to be, what they want to become, but they've not gotten any word from God about that particular thing. Vision, godly vision, requires revelation. The um, Amplified Bible says where there is no redemptive revelation, which means revelation will always point to who you are in Christ. The devil will try to remind you of who you used to be and tell you, no, you can't do that because of who you used to be. You dropped out of medical school three times. What makes you think you can be a doctor when you know God's called you to be a doctor? You can't get your own finances right. What makes you think you could qualify to be a CPA? The devil will always point to your flaw in revelation for your vision or, or, or concerning your vision. God will always point to your redemption in the revelation that he gives you. You've been redeemed from that. You've been, yes, you can help alcoholics because you've been redeemed from alcoholism. Yes, you can raise godly children because you've been redeemed from your past. Yes, you can be rich because you've been redeemed from poverty. It'll always point to who you are in Christ as opposed to who you used to be before you received revelation. Now, catch this. Vision and revelation are symbiotic. Revelation from God will always point to your redemption. And most vision requires revelation because it requires you to make some level of change. Most vision requires revelation because it requires you to make some level of change. Majority of vision that God's going to give you will require you to make some form of adjustment of adjustment, even if it's you need to study more, you need to pray more, you need to fast more, you need to be in the presence of the Lord more, you need to worship more. Something that's going to move you from where you are to where you need to be. God does everything in increasing measure. He does not stay still and he doesn't go backwards. He's constantly spreading out, growing, expanding, and vision should provoke you to grow, spread out, and expand. Amen. From glory to glory. To glory. Well, how are you going to live at a higher level of glory trying to do this level of glory stuff? Amen? Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, I can leave that alone. Number five, vision requires cooperation. Vision is not standalone. It cooperates with those that you've been placed in covenant with, whether that's work, family or friends. Vision is not standalone. It requires that you cooperate with the people that you are in covenant with. Now, I'm going to say something. I don't think I'm going to get in trouble with it, but y'all just going to have to love me as family. OK, if God placed you in a church. And didn't tell you to leave. I don't care how angry you get at the people at the church. You ain't supposed to leave. Thank you. I'm glad that was very well, very well received. I don't, I was going to tell Brittany, hey, go outside, crank the car. Cause if I say this, I'm just saying, I'm going to have to, I may have to make a quick exit. If God placed you in the body, the Bible says that he places the members where he sees fit, not where you see fit because he's going to see a fit that you didn't necessarily see. So if God places you amongst believers to be in covenant with those, will you understand that when you are a part of a church, you're part of a covenant body of people, nice. right? We family, whether you like it or not, me and Doug George, we look just alike. Got that family resemblance going on right around the nose area. We, I'm just saying, I'm just saying when God places you as part of a family, he has fit and joined you as part of that family. Now, I'm, I'm getting back to vision. I didn't just change the sermon, but I, I figured that would wake you up. When God places you as a part of the family, he connects you in that family and offense should never, ever remove the connection. Uh, amen me on that one. But wait till I say this other part. All right. Nor should there ever be a carnal reason for you to disconnect. That's right. Amen. Let me put it in plain English. It can't be your idea. 
it can't be your idea. It can't be your idea. It can't be, oh, this job that I got is going to pay me double what I'm making. So we need to move. And that's why we're leaving the church. No. I knew it was going to go crank the car for real. <laughs> you, that can't be your reason for disconnecting. I'm, listen, are we trying to stand victoriously in life? Is that is that our goal? Right. Is that a part of our mission? Help help them stand victoriously in life. Well, to help you stand victoriously in life, you need to understand that you cannot disconnect from the place where you're drawing your grace. So I don't care how much they're going to pay you to disconnect. There'll be no grace on it. All right. What we got to understand is that grace is dispensed. And God has placed you in the place of the dispensation of the grace for your life. That's why you need a pastor. That's why what Pastor George is saying, it may not tickle everybody else's fancy, but it's supposed to tickle yours. Why? Because you are assigned here. Yes. That what's coming off that platform from behind that pulpit is grace for your life. I can prove it to you. I, I knew I was going to need scripture. I couldn't just come in here and say that. Right. Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter three. I'm going to wait till you get there. Because I want you to see this. Ephesians chapter three. You're like, aren't they going to put the scripture on the screen? No, I mean, you may want to highlight this, <laughs> circle it, circle it or underline it, put stars by it. Say we ain't going nowhere and like draw the little hand that Brother Copeland draws in his Bible pointing <laughs> to the scripture. This means we ain't going nowhere. All right. Ephesians chapter three, starting at verse one, says this. For this reason, I, Paul. The prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, verse two, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which was given to me. What does it say for you? Was given to me for you was given to me for you. What's Paul's assignment to evangelize, preach the gospel to the Gentiles? So there's a grace on Paul that was given to him from God for those who would hear the gospel. Amen. I would submit to you that there's a grace on Pastor George. There's a grace on Pastor Terry. There's a grace on the leadership of our church that was given to the leadership of our church for you. Amen. For you. For you. I would even assert to you that things can be said from this pulpit that can't be said from other pulpits and it sound the same because it doesn't have the grace for you. Is the car still running? All right, because we're going to read it in the Amplified. <laughs> anyway, listen. Amplified Bible says this, for this reason, because I preached that you are thus built up together, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake and on behalf of you Gentiles. Watch this. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, his unmerited favor that was entrusted to me to dispense to you for your benefit. In Alabama, we would say some of y'all looking at me like a calf at a new gate. But it's for your benefit. There is a grace. If God brought you here. No matter how upset you get with anything that happens here, there's a grace on here that is for your benefit. That if you choose to disconnect from it, you choose to disconnect from that dispensation of your grace. Now, what does that have to do with vision? Pastor John, you said you were going to get your vision then should cooperate with the vision for where your grace is coming from. Mm -hmm. So when you hear something like the year of abundant harvest, then you have to develop vision for that vision. But whatever vision you develop has to cooperate with the vision on the prophetic word. Why? Because you're assigned to this house. Amen. You're assigned to this house. Your vision has to cooperate 
Your vision has to cooperate with the vision of the house. Now, I want to illustrate this because some of you, some of you may still be trying to deal with it. Um, vision should lift you up. And it takes grace on that vision to lift you up. So will you come join me for a second? We're going to go up on the big stage so you can see. Is it okay if I walk up here? Am I going to step out of the light too much? Amen. See the size difference? Glory to God. He's my friend. He, if I'm walking through a dark alley, thank you. <laughs> if I'm walking through a dark alley, I'm taking him with me. All right. I want you to just, just sit down right here in this area. Face me. All right. And hand me your hand. Now, let's say his vision is to get up off the floor. All right. But he refuses to cooperate with the grace that will pull him up. All right. I don't want you to do anything. OK, don't cooperate. Do nothing. All right. Just sit there. No matter how much grace pulls. He's not moving. And sometimes we get upset because we got vision to get up out of the place where we are. But we refuse to cooperate with the grace that's pulling us up. So I can pull all I want to, but he's not budging. Now watch this. Some of you were like, well, you know, grace means that I don't have to, you know, work for it. Grace means that I don't have to toil for it, right? Then he, then he, the, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he has no toil to it. I'm not asking you to toil. I'm just asking you to cooperate. All right. I don't want you to lift your own weight. OK, I just want you to cooperate with me. All right. That's all you got to do. You don't have to, like, put your feet in any, in any position or anything like that. Don't lift your own weight. Just cooperate with the vision of getting you up off the floor. All right. If all you do is cooperate. If all you do is cooperate with the grace for your vision. You actually don't have to lift yourself up. You just have to submit to the grace that will lift you anyway. He didn't lift himself up. No pressure on his knees. It's not like he struggled to get up off the ground. Let's do it again. Just make sure that there's no, nothing up my sleeve. All right. No tricks. All right. No, no special effects. All right. All right. If he does not cooperate, don't cooperate and just sits there, then there's a great struggle to get him to where he's supposed to be. But if all he'll do is cooperate with the grace that is on the house where he is. If all he'll do is cooperate with the grace that's on the word being preached. If all he'll do is cooperate with the with the revelation coming out of the mouth of the prophet. It only takes cooperation. If you'll just cooperate, he can get up off the ground. Listen, with no toil. That's an illustration of the verse that says the blessing of the Lord makes blessing actually means empowerment. The bless, the empowerment of the Lord makes rich and no toil is added to you. Don't have to struggle to get it. Just cooperate with the grace. Does that make sense? All right. Thank you, sir. I'm going to cooperate with that step. All right. All right. We're going to be done here. I'm going to give you, I gave you five ingredients to vision. I'm going to give you five functions of vision. This is the part that I hadn't got to yet. All the students are like, okay, good. This is, I actually get to hear what I didn't get to. Five functions of vision. Number one, vision causes momentum. Vision will move the, the ball down the field. I want you to notice that in the scripture, Proverbs 29, verse 18, it says, write the vision, make it plain. So he who reads it may do what? Huh? 
You mean to tell me that my vision in cooperation with the grace that's on this house, when I share my vision with somebody else who has the same grace on their life as I have on my life coming from the same place. Now, the grace is discriminate. It may not be even your vision. But when you start to share that vision, it causes momentum. Your vision will spur somebody else to get vision. Just notice it. There are two people in the scripture. Right. There's the person who's writing the vision and then there's the person who's reading it and running with it. Vision will cause the ball to move down the field. Vision will cause those things that be not at, to come to pass. Why? Because I'm calling the things that are not as though they are. See what I'm saying? Vision will actually cause momentum. This is my favorite one or one of my favorite ones. Number two, vision will provoke honor. Vision will provoke honor. When you know who you are in Christ, it's easier for you to honor somebody else who knows who they are in Christ. It's easier for you to honor the person next to you, the person around you, the person at the mall, no matter how much they curse you out, no matter how much they want, about how bad they got your order wrong. Doesn't matter what they said to you at your job or who got promoted over you or whether or not you were more qualified. It's easier for you to stay in a place of honor. When you have vision for what God is going to do in your life. Doesn't matter what you do. You can't stop the plan of God on my life. Doesn't matter what you said about me. You can't say anything about me that's going to change what my father has already said about me. And as long as I keep saying what he says, I'll get what he says. So it's easier for me to honor you, even if you're dishonorable. Number three, vision. I want you to write this one down. We're going to spend some time on number three. I put it number three. I I didn't put these in any particular order, but I put it number three because I knew that I might want to talk about this for a minute. This is my favorite part of this scripture. Vision will restrain you. Vision will restrain you. I tell my bridge students, I I I say it to to them this way. Who who in here knows what I'm about to say? Who's in the bridge in here? You know, what what am I about to say? Say, Stand up and yell it out real loud. Well, I'm in your blessing class. Okay, that's fine. uh, One of the things you said that uh, if the boy isn't saved and doesn't speak in tongues. Oh, no, no, that's a different example. (laughs) That is good life advice, but if it, vision stops you from doing what? Who, who, who said it? Who said it? Stupid. That's absolutely right. Vision will stop you from doing stupid. Uh, you can write it down just like that. <laughs> vision will stop you from doing stupid. Let's look back at the scripture. Proverbs 29, verse 18. It says, where there is no vision, in the New King James Version of the Bible says, where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. Which means that where there is vision, there is actual restraint. What does it mean, cast off restraint? That same word for cast off restraint is in the story of Moses and the, and the children of Israel and the golden calf. And it said that the children of Israel worshipped an idol because they were unrestrained. Some versions of this scripture will actually say that vision, lack of vision, makes you loose. It affects and clouds your judgment and makes you, or allow, whether it makes you, it allows you to make decisions in your carnal reasoning rather than in the word of God. Vision will restrain you. So no matter how bad you want to tell your family member exactly what you think about them, if you have a vision for that family member getting saved, it'll stop you from saying what you want to say in the flesh. No matter how much you want to buy, go out and take out a loan for that car that you've been wanting to drive since you were 16. If you got a vision for your money then that vision will stop you from going to do something that's going to cost you more down the line. I believe you need vision no matter what you do. Seriously, I don't, if I were you, I wouldn't go to Walmart without vision. (laughs) 
Don't don't even go into the grocery store without vision. Why? Anybody in here ever went to Walmart for a can of soup and you came out with an oil change, a tire change, five Teletubbies, a dog leash, and you don't even have a dog, dog food for the neighborhood dog, cat food for the neighborhood cat, and you just had to have one of those big ugly masks that with the eyes cut out so you could walk around and look, okay, maybe that was just me. Anyway. <laughs> If you've ever gone to Walmart when you didn't have vision, i.e. a grocery list, you end up coming out with stuff that you just don't need. I don't care if the shirt was $2.50 and it was on sale. And look at how much I saved. No, look at what you spent. Vision will restrain you from doing stupid. Vision will stop you from spending money if you have a vision for your money. Vision will control what you say to your children if you have a vision for what you want that child to be. You can't tell your child you bad if you want him to be good. You can't tell your child you're stupid if you want him to be smart. Vision will control you and it'll change your attitude because vision will give you the proper attitude for what it is that you want to see, even in the face of what you're seeing in the natural. So when all of your attitude wants to react, vision will hold your reaction back because you don't see it in the natural. You see what it's going to be. And here's the thing about seeing what it's going to be. Since I see what it's going to be, I'm going to sow seed into what it's going to be, as opposed to sowing seed into what it is right now. Didn't we just say earlier, what seed? The word is seed. The sower sows the word. The sower sows the word. So no matter what it is I see in Jeremy right now, if I, got a, if I have a vision for what Jeremy is going to be, I'm going to talk to Jeremy like he was what I have a vision for as opposed to what he is right now. Why? Because I want what it is that he's going to be to line up with the current, not what not to further entrench what he is right now. It'll stop me from saying certain things to Jeremy because I can't afford to say those things and call the things that are as though they ought to be. I can't afford that. I can't afford that. I can't afford that. I can't afford that. Vision for your marriage will restrain you and actually save your marriage. Vision for your marriage will actually restrain you and save your marriage. Why? Because you'll start talking about your spouse like you're going to be with them for the rest of your life. You don't tell somebody you're going to be with for the rest of your life. I hate you. I can't hate you. you We're going to live together for the rest of our life forever and ever. Amen. Till death do you part. Amen. And if you like me, death ain't going to do me part. We're just waiting on the Lord to get back and we're just going to ride out of this bad boy. So I got to talk to you like we're going to be together for eternity. I got to treat you like you're going to be like we're going to be together for eternity. Brittany is taking notes like a mad woman right now. She's like, oh, he said it. He said it. I'm just not going to let him act a fool at home. (laughs) But vision will help you with your marriage because it'll stop you from doing stupid. We all need a little help not doing stupid. I know you, Jesus third cousin and the spirit of stupid has never arrested you. It's never come upon you. So let's not talk about you. Let's talk about them. They need help not doing (laughs) stupid. Vision. Number four, vision begets vision. Vision begets vision. If you do this properly, what you'll find is you'll have vision for your vision. And then you'll have vision for that vision. Therein is the function of growing your faith, right? So if you let me outline this correctly, 
maybe just maybe God did speak to you about being a millionaire and being a clearing house and being able to help other people get out of debt and being able to pay other people's bills. But maybe just maybe your reality says I can't keep myself out of debt and I can't pay my own bills. Well, vision, this vision, the micro vision or, or the macro vision up here that I'm going to be able to help other people get out of debt will inform vision down the line to the micro level. So I have vision for being able to pay my bills on time. And now that I can pay my bills on time, I have vision that once I'm able to pay my bills on time, I'm going to be able to, 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 to grow a reserve, a storehouse. And God's going to bless that storehouse. So now I have vision for taking what's in that storehouse and responding to the word of God. So if he tells me to invest it, I know where to invest it. If he says empty it out and sow it into a building project, I know how to go and sow it into that building project. But because I have vision for the incremental move of God on my money, I'm able to get to the macro vision of being able to help somebody else out of where I started. Vision begets vision. Last one. We're almost done. Spoken word based vision carries God's power and will put that power to work for you. Spoken, word-based vision carries within it God's power and will put that power to work for you. I quoted the scripture earlier, but I want us to actually go look at it. Go to Hebrews. Hebrews. Um, let's see. Chapter 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Just that little section that says by the word of his power says this and in the amplified and he is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. Now, it's interesting that scripture, he could have said by his powerful word. But he didn't say that he said by the word of his power, which means that, yes, God's word is powerful, but his word is the vehicle of his power. His word is the carrier of his power. Now watch this. I got two minutes and 30 seconds to paint this picture. When his word becomes your vision, it carries the power of its originator, God. Amen. So if God said it about you, all of the power necessary to do what it is, that he has said about you is in that word. It's the vehicle of the power necessary to bring about what he has said about you. So when you have word based divine revelation vision, it had it did not have its origins with you. So it's not limited by you. You see this? You see this? When you have God revelation for your vision, since it didn't come from you, it's not limited by you. But since you can open your mouth and say what he says, it is released by you. And the power that is in those words is the power of almighty God. So when I say what he says, I get what I say because it's his power working in me to affect change. Word based vision will operate just like the word of God. So if the word, if he sent his word and healed you, what happens when you send your word into your sick situation? And it came from him. It healed. It's healed. It's healed. It's healed. What happens when I send the word into my bank account? It's healed. 
Why? Because it's his word Amen. and it carries the full force of his power to create that which doesn't exist. It doesn't matter. Listen, some of you guys got vision for things that don't even exist. I believe we got people sitting in here amongst us with vision for stuff that has never been done before. It doesn't matter whether or not it's been done before. The moment that vision lines up with the word of God and there's a word, a divine revelation word, a rhema a word from God concerning that vision. It carries the full force and credit of all of heaven and God will back you. Amen. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. I am done. Pastor Greg. That's good, huh? Amen. John, I was thinking about this. This is what John and I do pretty much every day. There's a couple of words in Hebrew for vision. One has to do with your eyesight. And the other one is kazon. Kazon means to forecast, to dream, or a revelation. So your fork, what you were saying just a second ago, you're forecasting what's about to happen. That's good stuff. Hey, you need to get the notes for that tonight. You need to watch that again. You need to take your own notes because there's something about, we, we provide notes, but there's something about when you write it down. Come on, it gets in you, a uh, uh, double fold. Awesome, awesome word tonight. Thank you very much, Pastor uh, John Jester. I want to remind you of a couple of things before we go off the network this evening. Rick Renner will be here this Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 10 Central. Denise Renner will be at Thrive on Tuesday. Women, you need to be there. If you, if you can be there, you need to be there for that. And then Pastor John's back with us next Wednesday. So that'll be awesome. And then I wanted to remind you, those of you in the local church, date night for married couples only. So if you're not married, you got to hurry. Dr. Irby, you can hook him up on that and get him married real quick. And uh, married February 15th from 7 to 9, emic.org for more information. February 15th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And I'm sorry, guys, I know that she just heard about this. So it's date night, right, on February 15th right here at the church. No Wednesday p.m. service on February the 27th. Those of you on the network, there will be programming for you, but locally, no Wednesday night church services because we are getting ready for Kenneth Copeland and you. Kenneth Copeland and me on the mountain the next night, March, uh, no, it's not March, that is uh, February 28th through March the 2nd. There's teaching sessions in the morning as well. Those of you watching us around the world, you can see it right there on the bottom of the screen. There's teaching uh, segments during the morning and um, then Brother Copeland every night. And that's how you get immersed in the word. I encourage you, I dare you to be here and get total immersion. That's how your faith grows. You're not a good word of faither unless you immerse. You can't tippy toe and try this thing, right? How many of you learned to swim by jumping in the deep end? Anybody? How many of you learned by somebody throwing you in the deep end? Well, that's what we're talking about. Uh, for this. So Kenneth Copeland and you, Jesse Duplantis will be here. See, I've got my earpiece in so I can hear the people all the way around the world. They cheered louder than you for that. Je you're looking at me like, can he hear them? Yeah, and I can see you where you're watching. No, I can't either. I had somebody accuse me of that. Can you see where I'm watching from? March the 7th, a bunch of people just logged off. March, <laughs> I saw you in your slippers. No, I didn't. March the 17th, Jesse Duplantis, spirit of Jesse's getting on me or something, being silly up here. Um, that's March the 17th on a Sunday. Miracles on the Mountain, March the, March the 29th and March the 30th. So you want to make yourself available to that. EMIC.org, you can find out about those things on the rotator. KCM.org slash events is where you can find all the places and information of everywhere where Brother Copeland's going to be somewhere near you. I encourage you to go to that. KCM.org slash 
events. Just make it one of your absolute favorite places. We're going to see you back here Sunday morning for Faith Foundations at 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 Central, and then we'll see you again um, at 10 Central Time. Here we go. God loves you. We love you. And Jesus is Lord. Real quick, here's something I want you to do. They're going to put a, they're going to put an address up on the screen. It is info at or is it info at EMIC or EMIC info? What does it say? Info at emic.org. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to look at that email. Won't go anywhere else. You don't have to put your name on it. Tell me why you come to Wednesday night. Don't go spiritual on me. Just tell me why. Tell me why it's important. Tell me what.